Hello everyone, welcome back. So in this video, we are going to talk about the mutual information as I highlighted here. I do hope that I can have the chance to introduce a, what we call a neural model with the input and output. And now you have two sets of random variables and you do hope that how you can actually maximize the information conveyed from x to 1. In extreme case, uh, you can see if the input x follows some specific probability, you try to figure out, and this neural model is a really, really lazy guy. He just uh, then check, didn't take down any information from the x, and then just use a random, generate, random number generator to generate y to you. How would you know? How would you know? So that's a very interesting uh, concept. And before we begin, again, uh, I hope that gradually that you guys uh, will get to yeah, get get to get familiar with the YouTube live and getting the tempo up. Huh? And I do receive several questions, about including one of Shannon's uh, important theorem about how the encoding is. So I will encourage Mr. Cross go back to the YouTube video and then type out your question there. Uh, and so then I will share the, the question that I figure out for you. So that was a pretty good one. I hope that I will also receive uh, several good questions uh, during this video clip as well. Okay, okay. So enough chit chats. That's a uh, start climbing the mountain. Ta -da. Yes. Let me adjust uh, my videos for a little bit. And okay, it's not working. Okay, it's working now. Okay, okay. Mutual information. So, what exactly is mutual information? So, before we doing that, let's start from the very very beginning. That's what we call the joint entropies, uh, H, X, Y. And please be noted, whenever I find a capital H, that means the information entropy for discrete random variable. And if I write down a lowercase h, that just means uh, that's the information entropy uh, for the continuous random variable. Or more professionally, it's called differential entropy that we talk about in the previous uh, video. Okay, okay, so. so in previous videos, we know how to quantify the, the information conveyed uh, per message for a single random variable. So what happens if you have two random variables, right? This input and this output, and how are you going to cope with that? This is something exciting, isn't it? So, that's uh, first. Uh, go back to our probability theory first. We have this joint probability density function, right? So this Pxy. And remember that this Pxy can be written as a product uh, of conditional probability. So the probability for x and y occurred uh, can be understood as the probability that x occurred. And under the conditions uh, when x occurs, uh, what is the probability that y occurred? And we explained this in our Markovian chain before for this sort of relation, and this relation is universally true. And as you can see, or in fact, if you just uh, reshuffle this term, that's the definition of conditional probability that you learned before. And if x and y are independent random variables, which means that on the, con the conditional probability of y is the same as py, then you got this joint probability is nothing but the product of px times py. That is the special case uh, when you have uh, two independent random variables. Okay, so inspired by the idea that the probability for x and y to occur is this uh, pxy, and then, on the condition when x occurs, what's the probability y occurs? We should be able to define our entropy this way. 
as well, right? So the whole idea is that we should be able to define the joint entropy at x, y corresponding to the information contents uh, of the joint probability p, x, y. So that part is simple. And let's just assume that this, since we have explained before, that this h, x, y represent uncertainty of h, y, can maybe then be decomposed into the uncertainty of h. And also, once the x is specified, the uncertainty of y. And because x and y might be related, and that's why that this sort of conditional understanding is important. So one can say that this is the uncertainty of x, y altogether. This is the uncertainty of x. And this is when x is specified, what is the uncertainty of y. And since this reasoning apparently is symmetrical, right? One can also start with y and saying that maybe for this y, the uncertainty of y plus once y is specified, okay, once y is specified, the uncertainty of x, when you add them up together, that would just give you a joint entropy of the random variable x and y. And these are actually very intuitive. And that's try to really go down to the definition of this whole thing that I would just introduce. Uh, because you probably know hx, you know hy, you know hxy, right? But once you know the probability distribution function, you can calculate the Shannon entropy. But we didn't really define what this means. And so then I will show you how we introduce the appropriate definition so that this whole concept works. So let's go back to the definition of hxy. That is an average value of the information minus log pxy, average over pxy, right? And making use of the identity that this pxy can be written as px and the conditional probability of py. And then this log can separate the products uh, into two terms, uh, this term and this term. And please keep in mind, even though that I have a typo, I didn't write it out. And this is average over pxy. Then it starts to see two things. Uh, why this decomposition makes sense. First of all, let's uh, look at this term here. Okay, So this term by definition is averaging over the joint probability density the joint PDF and log PX. But we introduced the marginal probability before, right? If you have this joint probability and integrate over all possible dy, that you end up with a function. And that function turns out to be just the PDF for the random variable x. So by carrying out the integration, partially first, because this does not carry any y dependence, so then you got this term here. So this is really beautiful. And once you got this, that is just our good old friend. Oh, okay, not, probably not good old friend, just the friend that you learned uh, in the previous video. That's the channel entropy associated with the random variable x. So what about the other terms? We basically just define the other terms uh, as uh, h, y. Is, uh, on the condition that x is specified. Okay, so it's defined this way. But if you write it out, what exactly does that mean? Well, what that means is the following. This p y bar over x, that is, uh, and with the minus sign, you just revert uh, the, well, okay, I'm keeping the minus sign here. So this p y x, what exactly is that? That is the probability x, y divided by p, x here, right? So you're taking this log and then averaging over this whole thing. Again, again, if y and x are independent, then you might think that whether you assign the x or not doesn't really affect the uncertainty of the random variable, right? So this definition actually reproduced that result. 
because when p x y when x y are independent, this p x y is a p x times p y. The p x cancel out, and this whole term becomes a log p y. And this p x y, you can then do the partial sums uh, over d x. Then you got p y. And this whole thing, uh, when x and y are independent uh, random variables, uh, well then just go back to h y. So that makes sense, right? And that make even better sense than when x, y are independent, so the h, x and h, y add up together is just h, x, y. So this is a really nice uh, definition. So we sort of complete the first half of this uh, explanation that how this uh, relative, what we call the, <coughs> sorry, the conditional entropy is, uh, of y is defined. But there is another way that you can define the conditional entropy of x once the y is known, right? And so you can repeat basically the same calculation and then you will end up with basically exactly the same result. So then I won't repeat that uh, here. So these are the first result that we know for the joint probability and also how this is related to the conditional entropy. Okay. With that known, uh, since this is defined, right? So then we can think about uh, how much information uh, one can convey uh, between x and y. If x is similarly to some random variable, y is also similarly some random variable. How, are you, how do you know that whether they are related or not? Maybe they are independent. And if they are independent, then the mutual information between them should be zero. So how can you find whether they are related to each other? Okay, so the whole idea is that we need to come up with some good definition of the information content, which becomes zero when x and y are independent. And here is how we come up with this. We think about the mutual information is shared by these uh, random variables. So we start with the uncertainty of x and subtract the uncertainty once y is known. Okay? And if x and y are independent, then this conditional entropy is exactly the same as this one. That is, whether you know why or not, it doesn't matter, the uncertainty is the same. Then this gives you zero. So this is a really nice way of defining the mutual information. That is, when x and y are independent, then their mutual information is zero. Okay, and if you write it down, you will find it's a as a it's microscopic expression this is extremely nice. So first of all, write down the hx, and as we already showed before, that's just log one of px, right? And here I intentionally instead of writing px dx, I'm writing px y dx dy, and you know they are equivalent because uh, if you calculate the partial integration first, you got px. Okay, so that's corresponding to the first term. What about the second term? Well, the second term, here you encounter this hxy, right? So that is the average values over pxy, that is the part, and the probabilities uh, of uh, conditional x when y is specified. And that is pxy divided by when py is known. So then that's log uh, pxy divided by py, okay? So then you got this form here, and when you have two logs, you just uh, multiply them together, and then you got this one here. How nice is this? So you immediately realize that what is the mutual information uh, between two random variables x, y? Is really you are compelling the probability, the joint probability p, x, y, and the probability p, x times p, y. And if p x y just equal to p x times p y, and of course then you just got log with a one, 
and so log one is zero, so then there is no mutual information be between them. Okay, so that's the Q part. And this microscopic in explanation in terms of joint probability uh, also suggests that this IXY and IYX should be symmetrical, they should equal to each other. And since this is an important concept, so we are going to dig a little bit more inside this. So right now, this is, sorry, this is IXY, right? So it starts from the information content of X, subtract when Y is known, what is the residual information content uh, in the not so random variables X, okay? So that's the mutual information. In principle, one should be able to just define a mutual information yx, which is starting from y and subtracting the, when x is known, the, what is that? And this difference, uh, basically, just write it down that this hy contains a log 1 over py, and the conditional probability of y on x is just log pxy divided by px. Again, you combine them together, you just got exactly the same expression as the mutual information IXY. So IYX and IXY are the same, so they are symmetry. So that's indeed the mutual information. So the second thing one can try to prove is it's uh, non-negative. And since again, this is just a mathematical proof of the log functions, uh, so I won't bore you with the detail. Basically, that this i x y is always positive, so then it really satisfies the what we call the, inf the the properties of information that we learned in the previous one. So, but then this mutual information does not evolve just one probability. It's talking about the information content by two related probability distribution function. That's really cute, right? And since uh, microscopically, in terms of joint probability, it has this expression, uh, we can go back to the KL divergence, uh, and you will find that this mutual information and KL divergence are also related. As I said, that this mutual information has two ways of looking at it, and they lead to exactly the same expression. That is coming from the uncertainty of the random variable x and then subtract okay subtract once y is sure what is the uncertainty in x and because these are all positive so then you know that this i is actually smaller than hx and this i is also smaller than hy okay and when x and y are independent then this i is absolutely zero so and since it has this expression, that is just comparing the difference between the prob joint probability density function and the products of px and py. So this can be written as the KL divergence. Okay, since you are comparing two different probability distributions, right? So that would be the KL divergence PXY and PX times PY. Please be noted the KL divergence is not symmetrical when you're talking about two probability distribution function. So you need to write this in the first place and writing PX PY in the second place. Okay? If you reverse the order, they are wrong. But on the other hand, when we're talking about the symmetric relations of mutual information, I'm talking about changing the order of the random variable x and y. And this KL divergence, of course, uh, satisfies that symmetry relation because uh, a joint probability PXY is, of course, the same as PYX. That depends on how you would like to write it, right? And this PX times PY, of course, equals uh, to PY times PX. So please do not confuse uh, these two things up. Okay, so right now we have this uh, joint entropies and all sort of things, and I just want to use a very simple, okay, 
a very simple idea of this to express it. Basically, for the join probability density function, it has a join differential entropy associated with that, and that is the mother set that's HXY. And this HXY, of course, is more random than HX or more random than HY in general. And that's why that this is larger than this one and this is larger than this one. Remember, the information conveyed is basically the same as uncertainty of the system. And because the system contains two random variables, this is, of course, uh, more uncertain than just one random variable. So you see this uh, inequality relations uh, between HXY, HX, and HY. Here comes the Q part. As we said, inspired by the conditional probability, right? So here we have this conditional entropy. So this HXY can be written as a sum of HY times when Y is fixed, the conditional probability of X. And this sort of makes sense in, in, in a way that when we try to find the total uncertainty of X and Y, and we can first ask what is the uncertainty of y and once y is certain what is the uncertainty of x and you add them up you got this whole thing on the other hand of course you can also view this as okay i'm looking at how uncertain the x is plus the uncertainty of y under on the condition where x is specified right and so then you got HX and HY. Okay, so you add it up and then you still got HXY. And finally, that is the one that we talk about the mutual information. So what does mutual information mean? Mutual information is that if I look at the information content in the random variable Y and asking how much is really coming from the information conveyed from x to y. From this figure, of course, you can take the common set of this, but we're deriving these whole things from the concept that this hy here is the uncertainty of y. And this is when x is known, the uncertainty of y. And the difference between them is how the information relating x, y together. So now you can see with this figure in mind, uh, if X and Y are independent, if they are independent, okay? So then this I, X, Y will shrink to zero. And since this N and this N will move accordingly, so then this H, X, Y, this H probably will then shrink here, this H, Y here. So then if you add these two, then you will get this one. And there's no intersection between this HX and HY, so this is zero. And that's when this HYX and HY is the same, and this HX, HX bar Y is the same. So that is the case uh, when X and Y are independent. And here I would like to ask you another question that you should play around with these figures. Uh, and then really go back and sit down and ask yourself, what if? Y is just a transform the random variable X. That is, uh, even though by looking at Y, it seems to be a random variable, but it is not really a random variable. Once X is specified, Y is specified. So how does this figure change when you have this situation here? Apparently, uh, in this case, the mutual information should be somehow large, right? Because once you know x, you know y. Once you know y, you know x. Well, assuming that this uh, function here is, uh, can be inverted. So think about this. This is really cute. But of course, as a warm up, really try to go through what happens. Draw exactly this same figure here. That what happens when x and y are independent. And then move on to the next one. What happens uh, if y is nothing but a function? of x. Okay? So that should be fun. Okay, dokeries. Now that's a move on.
to our key question today. That is, suppose now I have a really complicated neural model. It can be a many many layer deep learning machine. It can be a single neuron and everything. So I have input x, I have output y, and I want to ask. If I try to maximize the information conveyed from x to y, what event, what eventually is, uh, do I get? And this is typically the, what happens in a learning machine or in your brain, right? When you are taking some information in, of course, uh, you will generate some output. And you do hope the information content uh, between x and y is somehow optimized, right? And I can show you something pretty cute and interesting that is that by using the mutual information we learned as the optimized function, you get something really, really cute. But let me emphasize one more time that this input output problem uh, has many, many different branches. Uh, and so optimizing mutual information is just one possible scenario. You do not necessarily need to do this. And one of the things that I love this sort of uh, data analysis is that there is really no just one particular correct way of doing it. So this is not really the same as physics. In physics, uh, conf confined by conservation law, by symmetry, by some other things, uh, typically we only have one or just a few answers. Uh, Okay, and you can actually rank which answer is better than the others. But on the other hand, in learning machines or in machine learning, sometimes you find many effective algorithms to perform the same task. And that's sort of connected in real life, right? If you look at the successful person, a business person or engineer or scientist, they all have different brains and thus different algorithms and they seem to perform well. So there's something more abstract behind us. You cannot just uh, really count down to specific model and saying that all smart people must do so or must share these features. Okay. So without further delays, uh, let's see how we can apply this. This is truly exciting. So I'm going to okay, show you with a uh, not so exciting the neural models that uh, you might anticipate that, uh, wow, so we're going to learn some really, really multi-layer neuron. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, because even a single neuron, a single neuron can be complicated. So we start with single neuron with processing noise. That means that uh, you have inputs uh, going into one neuron so, and it give you one single output, how simple is that? But during the process, uh, there is some noise. The noise can come from the background noise, uh, your body temperatures or whatsoever. The microwave radiation from the, our universe. Okay. So in this very, very simple way, I do hope gradually you know how you can understand the mathematical relation from this very simple flow diagram. So you got x1, x2, x3, and these are the random variable. And for simplicity, I simply assume that I have pre-processing the data x1 to xm so that their means, or sometimes they call their bias, uh, is removed as other part of the information. I'm typically interested in how they are correlated and this sort of things. Okay. And they are connected to this node here with W1, W2 to Wm. So what that means is that when the data is on this node, that re is represented by the sum here. And furthermore, that this data is sent into this node with astral term, and this n here again is a random variable, and then you just add it up. And so this whole thing is uh, what then send to y, and that's why the y is written this way. Okay, so this mathematical relation can be directly read out from the network structures that I highlight here. And if I draw a dash line box here, this flow diagrams are 
contain exactly the same topology uh, as uh, I just show you here, right? So there's an input, there's an output, and inside there is just some uh, neural model processing uh, interiors and activities. Uh. So for your reference, I particularly highlight them as the input, the blue dots, the output, the pink dots, and the single neural activities as green dot, green dot, green dot. Okay. So with that said, uh, let's now try to calculate the mutual information and try to optimize it to see what would be the outcome. Okay. So the mutual information between Y and X is nothing but the entropy of Y minus the conditional entropy of Y once X is specified. So, but we calculated the Gaussian entropy before, right? So this HY here should be relatively simple. It's just one half plus one half log sigma Y squares. We'll come back to sigma Y squared because sigma Y squared, uh, it can be really complicated. So, so here I'm basically assuming that X1, X2 to XM are just some Gaussian noise. If it's not Gaussian, this just mean that when you compute this, it's slightly more complicated, but yeah. No, no big deal, seriously, trust me. And we also assume this noise here is white noise and thus is a Gaussian as well. And because you are adding all these uh, Gaussian random variables all together with slightly different coefficient, and you will get a Gaussian. Okay, so why is a Gaussian? And that's why the, when calculating the entropies, uh, you will get a Gaussian entropy as before, and then you got this one. But please be careful that the sigma y here can be a very complicated function of w and sigma x and sigma n. Okay, and but I will compute the function for you later on. So just keep that in mind. The second part is uh, we want to calculate the conditional the entropies. Okay, but then the PDF of y with given x is just the Gaussian distribution due to the noise n, right? So if the x is known, then this is basically just a bunch of constants, uh, and so the y will factor in with this n. So basically, on um, that conditional probabilities uh, for y is the same as the probability distributions for n. So that means that if I calculate the uncertainty of y with given x, that would be the same as the uncertainty of n because that's the only uncertainty left in y. And the uncertainty at n is one half, one half plus two pi sigma n squared. And since these two has exactly the same form, if you subtract them, the mutual information you got is at y minus uh, at uh, conditional y. And so then this one half cancel out and then you combine them together and you got one half log sigma y squared divided by sigma n squared. And this form is very, very suggestive. This mutual information, you want to optimize it, right? So then when you have this input uh, information x, you extract the maximized information uh, through the output y. And then you realize that that answer is, uh, depends on the ratio, but the sigma y squared divided by sigma n squared. How nice is that? So the sigma y is how significant that you got from the output and divided by the noise. Okay, so this is a very simple signal to noise ratio that you typically get uh, when you are trying to learn some data, so learn some inputs uh, by the output. So the next step is that if we want to maximize uh, the mutual information with a given processing uh, noise, uh, that is sigma n constant, and of course now we need to know what sigma y is, uh, that is you want to optimize uh, the signal, then you see something really smart and intelligent. So first of all, how can we maximize sigma y? Well, we need to calculate sigma y squared first. So I'm going to start with uh, a unnecessary, well, okay, it's probably necessary for teaching, <laughs> but unnecessary is for research. 
So I'm going to assume all random variables, all the inputs, uh, xi's are independent, which they, they're, they're boring. Apparently I have done some pre-processing of the data. So then the, all these inputs, the x1, x2, x3, and x4 to xm are all independent variables. Uh, and, but then they have different variants. And so on data science, we know when the variance is larger, then these data are the important one. Which means if you don't treat them properly, uh, you will lose most information. So that, that, that's trivial, right? Suppose now you have two random variables. One is not barely random, which is by sigma x2. Okay, it's really small. And if you just uh, misunderstood this whole thing and treating x2 as constant, it would be fine, right? It would be fine because uh, it really fluctuates. So keep in mind, in under this situation here, the importance of the signal, of the input signal, is uh, directly proportional to sigma squared. So for data with larger fluctuations, uh, these are the data characters that we need to pull out. Okay, okay. So now, let's just use the variance expectation that we learned in probability theory to compute sigma y squared. Because I intentionally choose the mean to be zero, so this calculation then becomes trivial, it's just y squared. They basically y times y. But y is a sum. And so when you square it, you got three different types of terms. The first term is this one that involves wi, wj, and xi, xj expectation value. The second term is the cross terms, uh, that is the xi and n. The third term, of course, is the n squared term. Okay. <gasps> I didn't square it correctly, let me reshuffle it. Sorry. It's n square average. Wow, this is important because uh, the previous one is zero. And so the cross term is zero. Why? Well, because we assume the noise and the data are not correlated. Okay, so, and this is commonly easy because the data you take in. For instance, it can be the photon distributions uh, on your retina, or it can be the phonon distributions uh, on your eardrum, where the noise uh, can be generated in your body and everything. It can be very complicated since it's so complicated, we just assume the, they are independent white noise. <laughs> and so you then just can decompose them, and decompose them, there are zero means. So this whole term, yes, it's zero. Ta da! And this xi and xj, these are unnecessary assumptions. I emphasize one more time. Typically, when you are phasing with the input, this xi, xj will form a covariance matrix, a non-trivial matrix with symmetric and real. And so then you can diagonalize that. It does not necessary to be diagonalized already. Okay. So these are pre-processed data in their eigenbasis. And this is just for simplicity that I try to uh, explain. And so because you use this one, so then this take on only the diagonal term. So that's uh, wi squared sigma x i squared. And so this term is nothing but sigma n squared. So after computing this whole thing, so you realize that the sigma y squared is relatively simple. It's sigma n squared. So this is the signal. This is the noise. So the signal is basically the noise plus the weighted, the input signal here. So if you want to optimize, if you want to maximize the sigma y, what's simple? If somehow you have a learning machine which the semantic way can adjust to each other, you just maximize the w's as large as you want. Wow, so this seems to be totally uncontrolled. That's basically just means if you want to become really, really smart, very simple. You just make all the synaptic connections uh, between your neurons uh, as strong as they can be. Unfortunately, unfortunately, all resources are limited and that doesn't really occur. So in real life, in realistic situation, the synaptic ways uh, will cause some energy or some penalties. And thus, you cannot make WIs uh, stronger and stronger indefinitely. And typically, we would just uh, impose a constraint, G 
to recognize this sort of uh, synaptic wave competition. That is the summation over all wi squared equal to 1. And let me put it this way, as long as you can find, so because uh, all sum to 1, that means that you can now, you need to emphasize how you distribute the synaptic wave instead of blindly pursuing the synaptic wave to go to infinity. And that's really the true competition that happens in all intelligent learning machines. In your brain, your brain needs to accommodate with the energy consumed, with the chemicals you they have at hand to build the appropriate synaptic ways in your brain so that you look smart. Okay? You simply do not have the condition to strengthen all synaptic ways indefinitely because you're just you just don't have that environment. So this is a very reasonable constraint. It may come in different form. For instance, uh, why can I just take absolute values? That would be fine. That modify the answer a little bit. And sometimes uh, you actually need to do exactly the same things. So, uh, you can also take it as four, which also can find it. Taking this, uh, what we call the L squared constraint, it's just a simple one which uh, you often encounter is, uh, in linear algebra. And it is also realistic. Okay? With that, now I'm going to make my single neuron intelligent. Okay? Before, before, in this situation here, the, this whole understanding is that for given w1 to wn, I'm calculating how sigma y, sigma x, sigma n are related. And once you know that, because we know if we want to maximize the signal to noise ratios, we better making the sigma y maximized. So how can you do that? Suppose now you relax the constraint, so then this w now become dynamical. That is the how this node can connect together. It depends on how you train the single neuron. So that's train our single neurons. So you would have this x1, x2 to xm then coming in. And ask yourself, at the end, I want to max my sigma y. What kind of w's should it evolve from the initial configurations to the end? The answer is simple, isn't it? Because we know that the sigma y is just a linear superposition with a different weighting wi squared of the sigma xi squared plus sigma n squared. Okay? And with this constraint, how can you maximize sigma y? Simple. Suppose the maximum uh, variance uh, of the initial input occurs at the index capital M, standing for the maximum. So the optimized uh, synaptic way, of course, is that goes to 1, and all other is 0, suppressed to 0. And that, of course, satisfies this constraint. And that would give you the maximized sigma y. Because uh, in that limit, the sigma y is the maximum the sigma xm squared plus sigma n squared. So what does that mean? That means that given realistic dynamics of the synaptics uh, to change their ways uh, after you come into lots of uh, random events, where this XM here, remember, I have re-removed re uh, the, I have removed the average value. So this X1, XM, XM are all random numbers uh, with positive and negative, okay? And so you can sort of think about this, that this XM here give you like large fluctuations, like minus 10, plus 10, minus 10, plus 10, and these are like saying, oh, okay, minus one plus two, minus one plus two. And if you are a meeting, suppose now the output is just that you need to make some decisions. You need to make some decision and it's sit with a, a bunch of people, okay? They have pre-processed the data with their eigenbases. And some people always say something which is almost irrelevant, saying, oh, is this person good? 
Oh, it's good in some sense, but it also has some. It has pros and cons, and blah blah blah. And after listening to that, then you found out the variance of X one is really small, and X M is also very small. And those sort of comments and suggestions are pretty much basically give you no information at all, right? Because no matter what the applicants are, these professors always say, "Uh, well, they're good and bad," and things like that. But there are also other professors. When an African comes in, oh, this is great, and another African comes back, oh, this is really bad, and so there's a huge fluctuation. So, so if you are a smart manager, you should pick up this because that contains more information. Okay, and that's indeed so. So after the training. Uh, this symmetric weight growth uh, to its maximum because I mentioned W i squared equal to one, so W i the maximum value of W i is one, so this will all grows to one, and then all others will be disconnected. Wow! So after training, uh, the output will simply learn to differentiate the most important uh, data resources. And here, as I emphasized、uh, before, I said that this is certainly not important, right? I'm using them as independent ones, so then I, it's much easier to to explain. So now try to convince yourself. Suppose now that this x i x j just I mean typically you could q i j. So this is the variance matrix. It's real and symmetrical, which can be diagonalized. In this case, if you try to if you try to optimize sigma y, it turns out that you need to find the maximum values. If you write it up, this will then become a general what we call the quadratic form that you learn in applied mathematics, and the To maximize or minimize the、uh, quadratic forms,、uh, it's basically the same as diagonalizing a、uh, Hermitian matrix, or in the real case, it's a real and symmetric matrix that can always be done. And at the end of the day, you will pick up the eigenvectors of the maximum eigenvalues. So this very simple neuron setup. If you don't assume, if you don't assume they are independent, then you will end up with w one to w m, and it happened. It happened to be the eigenvectors of this input source with the maximum eigenvalues. That means that this w one to w m will adjust themselves so that they can pick up the most important information in the input data. How smart is that? So, this smart behavior is、uh, only require one principle. That is, if you try to maximize、uh, the mutual informations、uh, between y and x, then your learning machines、uh, seems、uh, to behave、uh, rather smart. Okay. Once that is known,、uh, sometimes.、Uh, A single neuron might take a slightly different way. So, for instance, now I'm drawing a different structure, the different flow diagrams. You still have input x1 to xm, right? And so, inside some black box, and the outside that is your output. But the noise might occur differently. This is what we call the input noises. So, this is the input noise is that somehow when the data is read into this, the the noise. The single neurons are、uh, it got corrupted by independent noise, and thus、uh, instead of sending in x one, you're sending x one plus n one. Okay, you're sending x two plus n two, you're sending x n plus n n, and then the relation now becomes a、uh, more complicated. You get basically more noises、uh, associated with、uh, each input pixels or each input、uh, bases. And so then this n i here and x i here add together through the synaptic way and then compose the y here. Okay, 
So I will then leave these a different type of single neuron with input noises, which is different from the processing noise. And how are you going to calculate the mutual information I there? And once if you can calculate the mutual information I, Y, X, when maximizing the mutual information, can the single neuron be smart? Or when compare with the single neuron with processing noise, which one is smarter? Well, since now you have the information, the, you have the mutual information, right? So this is a sensible question. You can really calculate the mutual information and really calculate the reasonable values of their maximum value and to see which one is larger. And so are they equally smart or are they equally dumb or which one is smarter? I think that would be something really great uh, once you learn this whole thing and then you can play around and figure out the answer. And of course, if you got stuck or you get confused, uh, you can raise your questions uh, below the videos and leave your comments and suggestions and I will respond to them. Okay, do please. Here I again got a really interesting question from Ms. Crawl. How to find the eigenvector of a set of random variables? Okay, as a bonus, I'm gonna end the video here. But before we close in, we can think about this. I have a bunch of inputs, right? So let me just uh, copy, 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 copy. Let me go back to this one here. So suppose now I have a bunch of input and there is no reason why they should be independent. So we can actually construct a variant a variance matrix q i j and it's defined as a x i x j and from this definition it should be easy to see that this q i j here equal to q j i and then q i j star is a q i j so it's real and symmetrical and this is our favorite matrix uh, in physics, a physics department isn't it right real and symmetric so you can learn you, you can just use the matrix diagonalization to find the eigenvectors and what I didn't show you is that with this uh, variant matrix, right, you can find the eigenvector. And what I'm just saying is that this wi, this optimized wi, let me, with a star, this uh, optimized synaptic. By the way, synapse is the connection between neurons, synaptic weight. So this can be, of course, written as a vector, right? And what I just said without proof is that this wi here corresponding to the eigenvector of uh, the matrix Q, okay, with uh, Maxima eigenvalue. So basically, just saying that if we confine our neurons and letting the symmetric weight change dynamically so after bombarded by tons of uh, training data, so it will learn the maximum uh, eigenvalues, uh, eigenvector. So it will basically just pick up the most important uh, eigenvalues uh, and represent it with the corresponding eigenvector. I didn't show you in this video, but I think it would be really great for some of you, if you're interested, really go forward and then do it. 
And with this reasoning, you also know that y is picking up the maximum variance, right? Because if somehow you have already choose a basis for teaching purpose, I have rotated this xi to xi front to its eigenbasis. So then the matrix qij is already diagonalized. And that's why that you got this form. And this is nothing but its eigenvalues. And you can also show the matrix, uh, the, the variant matrix. Uh, the eigenvalue of the variant matrix is non-negative. So you can always represent it lambda 1 to lambda m as a sigma square xi. So it's either 0 or positive. And so this is really that I have secretly diagonalized the matrix for you. And the reason I thought is that it's easier for me to explain the concept without going into the algebraic details. But if you are interested, I strongly encourage you to complete the missing technical detail that I didn't explain here. Okay, dokery. So I hope that the explanation today sort of give you some idea that how do we, what do we mean by mutual information. So, and I also hope that with the learned technique of mutual information, you sort of know that how you can solve uh, yeah, these uh, input output problems uh, for a neural model. So, so I guess that I would just end my video today here. See you around next week. Have some fun.